Okay, guys, 17 days away from the NHL trade deadline, and you'll take a look at the standings right now. The Dallas Stars alone atop the Western Conference, so you've got a lot of fans wondering just how much tweaking they're going to do before March 3rd. One guy knows. I don't know how much he's going to tell us, but we're going to ask him. Jim Neal, the general manager (laughs) of the Dallas Stars, joining us on the show. How are you, Jim? Thanks for doing this. Yeah, I'm great, guys, and it's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very much. Before we get asking you questions that you may or may not answer, I, I got to ask you about just the trade deadline, how it's kind of changed over the years. I mean, if we were doing this show five, 10 years ago, I don't know if we're talking to you about this 17 days before. It seemed like GMs always wanted to wait until the very last minute. Trade deadline day was just madness. But that really has changed. We see blockbuster deals a couple weeks out. How much busier are you two weeks out from this deadline than, say, five or 10 years ago? Yeah, it's, you know, that, that, that's, it's, it's a great question because, you know, why is that? I guess, you know, what's, you know, it's a question. What's the answer for it? And I think it's a lot of it, you know, we talk about the flat cap. That's always an issue with people always talk about that. But I think what it is, it's, it's the parity and it's the, you know, who's in it, who's out of it. It shifts week by week. I think if two weeks ago, if you would have talked to me, he would have, I would have given you a different list of names that are going to be sellers and, and, and are going to be buyers and now it's vice versa and it's uh you know the parody in our league and i know people like we all talk about parody but it's there you know i was talking to our coaches last night after the game and we're watching other games after our game and every game is two two three two uh four three like we are we are in the we're in the playoff mode now everybody is you know you've got a you got four or five teams on each conference that are in a battle trying to get into the playoffs uh you got ourselves we're you know you, you mentioned earlier that we're comfortably in first place i don't know how to take away the comfort comfort uh, part of the word of the sentence i guess because uh, you know we're only two points up and we're yet you know five or six teams that are uh six to eight teams behind us but with two games at hand so it's tight everywhere and uh so that's where there's a different dynamics to the trade. You, you know, you think some teams are going to be in it right away, and all of a sudden they, they got out of it, but now they're back in it. And uh, so just a different dynamics to the uh, trade deadline field, I guess, out there. Jim, uh, you know, you've, uh, I mean, it's been an unbelievable year. I, I just, uh, every time the Wild play uh, Dallas, it's uh, it's usually one-sided on on your end. Um, so I haven't seen too many weaknesses with your team. When you have a guy like Jamie Ben playing, you know, with with a young kid like Wyatt Johnston on the third line, you pretty much know how deep you are. Um, last night I'm watching Heitzkin, and you obviously have the goalie and Ottinger. Um, where do you look right now and identify your needs? And and you mentioned the cap. I mean, you're one team that's you know pretty close to to the cap. So how do you maneuver if you have to go address those needs? Yeah. You know, I, I think if you you talk to most people, everyone wants to add scoring. You know, would you like to add another score? Yes, we all would. You know, the, these I talked about how tight the games are. You know, everybody would like to add some more scoring, but that's easier said than done. Um, I get my biggest, I guess, need, and I, and it, and it's something that I hope doesn't happen. Is you just want to make sure you've got enough uh, players available. We know what the grind of the NHL playoffs is. You know, it's a two month grind of playing every second night and, uh, you know, blocking shots, everything else. The biggest worry, I guess, for me is, is injuries. You know, I I like our team. Yes. Would you like to get better? Yes. You'd like to add another scoring forward, maybe another depth defenseman here or there. I think every team would like to do that. But the one thing that changes and that gets back maybe a little bit, the prior question is, you know, when do you make these trades? You know, I can go make a trade today, uh, you know, today or, or tomorrow, and all of a sudden, we're, you know, we're 17 days out and with three games to, to before the deadline, three days before the deadline, I get two or three injuries. I've already used my assets up and my money, my cap room to address something that I need a different need now. So that's the balancing act. Um, you know, we're always trying to get better. You guys all know it's a competitive league. We're all trying to get better, trying to keep up to the opposition. So would I like to add? Yes. But I also want to be considerate. Uh, what's the cost? What's the assets? Um, you know, job as a general manager is to be is to worry about today, tomorrow, and then the future. So I really got to balance that and be careful. And uh, but what, what excites me about our team and the kind of organization right now, we're in a pretty good spot. We, we've we've got a real good team down the minors. I got good depth down there, so I think I got enough depth 
if I do get a couple of injuries. Um, so just try to balance all those things together uh, with the unknown of still 17 days out. Jim, Michael, he mentioned Jamie Benn and kind of what his role has been. Um, how impressed are you with how he's been able to kind of reinvent his game? I mean, he's gone from being one of the best scorers in the NHL to a almost a defensive guy over a, a little stretch of time. And now he's, he's taking a, a young player under his wing. And it just, it feels like even though he may not be the, the star on this team or, or the, 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 the highest score, he's such an important part of this team. How impressed with how are with you are, yeah, sorry. How impressed are you with how he's reinvented himself? Well, I'm, 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 I'm very, very happy for Jamie. He's, he's, he's a consummate pro. Uh, he's our leader. He's our captain. Uh, He's a little bit of a unicorn in the league. There's not a lot of guys left like him. Uh, you know, when you talk the ultimate power forward, and when you talk power forward, it's somebody that can play any type of game physically, any type of physical type of game. Plus, they have to be able to chip in and score a little bit. And, and he is that guy. Yeah. And yes, you know, for two or three years, you know, he kind of got off of that a little bit. Now, a lot of injuries, the way he plays, there's going to be a lot of injuries, things happen, but uh, that's where I give him a lot of credit. He he changed his training this summer uh, and he's come into camp. You know, he's still the consummate pro he is, but between changing his training and I think a little resurgence of who he's playing with, you know, we we matched him up with Wyatt Johnson and Ty Delandria. I think that kind of rejuvenated him a little bit. He's kind of their big brother. He enjoys that role and uh you know, he's got some some other good players around him. I think it's just all come together for him. Uh, but it, it's a compliment to him. He he adjusted his game, uh, changed his training, got a little bit quicker, got a little bit lighter, and, and it's paid off for him. Jim, three words we hear a lot over the next couple of weeks, no movement clause. Um, being a GM, as you can attest to, is difficult enough. Uh, and Patrick Kane, I'm looking in your direction. Uh, you know, we, we hear it all the time where, it's up to the player and yes, they have earned it, but how difficult is that as a general manager, when you're trying to make a deal, you're trying to improve your team, you come up with a deal, you've got something with another GM and it's all up to does player X want to come to your team? I mean, that's just got to handcuff you at so many times. Yeah, it does handcuff you, but kind of, uh, I'm going to kind of repeat what you said that they have earned that right too. You know, we negotiate those contracts. They earn those rights. Uh, that comes into play a lot of times in negotiating the value of the, of the contract. So it, it's part of the business. We deal with it. Um, I think a lot of times though, uh, when you really do sit down with a player and his representatives, and if there's a deal there, I would say 90% of the time, the players are going to want to end up going. You know, they know if it's time. There's a reason they're probably on the market and they're probably going to a better situation. You know, they're on a team that, you know, is, you know, rebuilding whatever's going on uh, or they're not playing much, whatever the circumstances are. So usually they know it's probably kind of time to leave. And so in the end, if you're the right situation for them, I think they're going to look at coming to your team. Yeah, I don't think anybody is going to need to have their arms twisted to come to Dallas this year. Uh, <laughs> that is for sure. Um, Jim, let me ask you on, on another facet of, you know, things that we really didn't hear about 10 years ago, even ago when the cap came in was, was using third parties as a banker, finding landing spots for bad contracts. How much of that brokering now happens as a general manager that has limited cap space that might make, want to make moves? Do you already know who the bankers are right now? And I mean, is is it like that where you're now shopping to find the best prices, the best loan prices, the best interest rates, all that type of stuff? And and where did that evolution begin? And how tough is it to sometimes as a GM wrap your head around all that? Yeah, you know, a lot of this is is really it's been compounded because of our flat cap, you know, and we, we it's it's a good thing we we kind of forget three years ago where we're at with the whole world, you know, with COVID yeah. and everything else, and to see where we've come out of it, it's been actually it's. We're probably ahead of where I thought we'd all be. And I'm not just talking hockey, I think the whole world, you know, to think where we were at two years ago and trying to figure things out. And this is really, uh, this is just part of the process now. We've been a flat cap. Uh, you know, we all have to make decisions signing players. Um, part of that now is if we want to make trades, uh, there is limited uh resources cap wise financially so you do have to get other parties involved and uh you know we've sat down in our meetings we've gone through all different scenarios if we want x player uh 
with our cap situation as it stands today, how are we going to fit that in? Do we have a rough idea who the teams are? Yes. You know, through my conversations with teams, teams will bring up whether that, hey, we're in a situation that uh, if you, you need something, uh, you need to move some money, some cap room, uh, you know, we're, we're open to business. Now, there is a cost to doing that also, uh, which comes into play. And And I think one thing people need to realize, too, it's okay to do it on a when you have a contract. It's it's the it's the last year of a contract. It's a lot easier to do it. You know, there's there's going to be two months left in the season. Uh, you know, so you're down to you know really really fifty to sixty games of payroll left. So it, that brings the number down. Much harder to do if you start talking two, three, four, five, six years on a contract. That's a different story. Uh, you, you start having to carry. Uh, $2 million cap hit on a retention for the next two, three, four years. That's a whole different ball game. And that's hard to do. Jim, you mentioned the, the strain that the flat cap has put on teams. Um, we've heard some other GMs say that they, they, not that they necessarily like it, but that they kind of enjoy the fact that it magnifies the importance of how and, and, and of your job. And, and the better general managers can get around it, um, it kind of magnifies how good you are at the job. Do you like it as a challenge? No, I, I do. I, 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 our job is to manage this. You know, you, you, you're presented with, you know, players have to play within certain rules. There's penalties if you don't play a certain way. You can't hook. You know, there's. It's all in life. You know, we got a foundation. We got to work around, and it's no different for us. We have a flat cap. We know what it is, and we have to deal with it. And I think that's the fascinating part of the challenge. And I think something, you know, I was just talking yesterday to my staff. You know, there's talk about moving forward that the cap is going to go up. You know, it's going to go up five million, six million, whatever in the next two, three years. And that's okay, but I think we forget sometimes that when you talk about the high end players, the star players in the league, they're you know everybody's talking about how they're going to jump up in salaries. Well, that that extra five, six million is really just going to go to the star players. So we're still going to have to manage our cap with the rest of our roster. You know, we're a twenty man, twenty three man roster, whatever, however you manage it. So when you've got a young player that goes from making a million dollars to making eight or nine, 10 million, you got to find $8 million somewhere. You still got to manage that cap and you still have to find what's unique about our sport, a little bit different than the basketballs and some of these, you know, maybe baseball a little bit. We're a, we're a team sport where we're 20 players on the ice and you got to have depth. You got to play well. You can have two or three star players, but if you got, if all your money's gone to them and you haven't, Managed to put a roster together that could win. That's the toughest part. And so, yes, it's uh, it's made it challenging the flat cap. But I still think moving forward, we're going to be in the same situations. It's just you know, player X, who's a star player that's been making six million dollars, is going to jump to twelve million dollars. There's our jump in our cap. So how, how do we manage the roster? Sorry, Joe. I was just going to say, could it be a little frustrating though? Everything you just said, given the era we're in, where it's so easy for people like us or fans to know exactly the cap situations. I mean, you're a couple of keystrokes away from finding out exactly where everybody is against the cap, who's on what kind of contracts. And you're the guy who, who's got to pull off all the moves. It's a little frustrating at times that everyone's got that information. Well, I think, I think it's great. I think it's great that the fans, you know, you guys can know that here's the situations and it helps you understand when we, have to make certain moves that here's the hurdles we have to deal with. And it's, it's everybody's chance to put that GM cap on and say, Ooh, it, it, it sounds like it's easy, but all of a sudden you say, okay, but we got to do this and this and this. And, uh, you know, it, it opens up the uh, textbook to make everybody realize how, how tough it is, but it, but it's good. Like I said, that's our job. That's what we're here for. We've got other, we got people in our front offices that manage all this. And, uh, that's a unique part of, uh, about our sports and a cap system. And uh, so, so you no, know it's it's worked well. Our, our league's never been more competitive. And uh, like I said, we've been watching you know watching games the last two weeks. Every game is a playoff game every night. Jim, uh, you know, obviously we've seen how good of years guys like Rope Hints and, and Jason Robertson has had. Uh, you know, high skin and last night was I thought outstanding. Um, I wanted to ask you about one player that has been under the radar this year, and that's Gorianov. You know, obviously kind of a slow start to start the year, hasn't had a lot of production, but lately I watch him every single night, and I, I don't know if I've seen too many players that skate like him. W what is his future right now? Because, you know, young guy, last year of a deal that's pretty high cap hit, Arbright's, what do you do with him right now? 
Well, he's kind of, you know, he's one of the players that we talk about adding scoring and uh, it, it's been a tough year for him. You know, he's, he's only got two goals. Uh, he had a tough situation. He had to leave the team for a while because of a family situation. So he missed some time there. And uh, so it's just been a tough year for him. You know, he's, he's a goal scorer. And when goal scorers don't score, they get frustrated. And that's what he's been through. But you are right watching our games. The last three or four games, he's been, uh, he looks like himself again. He's uh, he's exploded out of the shoot. He, his speed is, he's as fast as him in the league. And he's, he's been a little bit snake, but he's had a ton of chances. They're just not going in. And, you know, he's, he's one of the, you know, when you look for, uh, solutions he's one of our solutions and so we're just hoping he starts to grab it and uh, if he does i think we're in a real good position and gives us a lot of different options uh but like i said it's, it's been a tough year for him and players go through this they're human beings too and you just try to push the right buttons you, you work with them and you hope that somewhere down the road uh let's hope in the playoffs uh, that he's a guy that makes a difference for us that, that's what you're that's what you're trying to achieve Jim, I can't let you go without asking about Jake Ottinger. Um, so go, you're all waiting for it's, it. It's it's so fascinating. Um, 16 because, minutes. Right, it took yeah, you 16 know, minutes know, to ask about Ottinger. The, the, the goalie position, it's obviously so important, but also some are hesitant to use first round picks on goalies because they're so hard to project. I'd like to ask you, like, what went into deciding to invest a first round pick in a goalie and, and obviously how happy are you now that you've got a 24 year old uh, really big talented goalie that looks like he can be your franchise goalie for a while yeah sorry jesse but my time's up so i, I can't answer that question <laughs> 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 yeah no he uh you know we we're fortunate as an organization i was uh I saw Jake play a lot under 18 team, under 17 team. Uh, so we saw him lots and uh, that was a draft. We had three, three pretty high picks. Uh, we moved up that year. Got Sometimes you got to be a little bit lucky. We, we got, uh, we moved up from nine to four uh, or nine to three, sorry, and got Miro Haskin in that year. And uh, we'd made a trade with Anaheim uh, for Patty Eves. And, the conditions of that was it was a second round pick that became a first um if they had success in the playoffs and they did so we had that extra first and then because the lottery had jason robertson sitting there high in the second round so it was a big draft for us and uh you know we we're sitting there we just had to, we'd come through the kerry letting years and then ben bishop but i knew ben was you know he was starting to age out a little bit so we we were looking for a goalie and just, you know, between our scouting staff doing a great job, having a good feel for Jake, uh, we just thought there was something special there. So we uh, we had that uh, late first round pick. We actually moved up a couple pick, picks in that draft to get him because I was getting a little bit worried that uh, there were some other teams, I think, thinking the way we were. Uh, so we, we got him and he's been everything more and better than we could ever wish for. He's, uh, you know, not only is a good goalie, great athlete, but, but he's a great person. And I keep telling people, uh, I think the real successful goalies are guys that the team wants to play for. And the team loves to play for Jake Ottinger. They respect him as a person, uh, the way he treats people. He's involved in the community. Uh, and then he's a hard worker. He's We've had to actually kind of kick him off the ice at times. He doesn't want to come off the ice. He always wants to, you know, we'll have a back-to-back -back and he still wants to come to the uh, skate in the morning on a back-to-back on -back when he's playing again. And we got to trying to manage his ice time better, but uh, that's a good problem. It's better, easier to take it away than to give it type of thing and push for it. So he's been a great addition for us. And I still think he, there's still more there. He's still, uh, I think he's got another level to go to and uh, yeah, we're just fortunate to have him. Jim quickly stepping aside from the stars for a second. I got to ask you about this. It's been a topic on our show the entire season. It, it hit the heights a little bit at the all-star break when Sidney Crosby weighed in on this as well. Playoff format. Uh, the three of us are in favor of one versus eight. I know Sidney Crosby's in favor of one versus eight. The commissioner kind of said it's not as easy as you think. Um, as a general manager, if, if you <laughs> were able to take a choice, would you stick with the divisional playoffs or go to a one versus eight? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not being political here, but the, the, uh, the commissioner is correct that there's different issues. I love it. If I know that we're playing somebody that's an hour and a half flight away, and then I wouldn't like it. Uh, you know, we, I, I was a long time in Detroit and we were in the Western Conference. 
many, many years. And it's no different than down here in Dallas. And Dallas used to be in the Pacific Division. And uh, I don't know how many times in Detroit we would end up playing Vancouver, San Jose, or LA in the first or second round. And you start adding in the time zone change in the travel. It, it's tough. It is hard. And it's and it's hard on your fans. You start having games at 10 o'clock at night, uh, playoff fans. So there's not only a hockey side, hockey operations side, there's a business side to it too. And uh, I think divisional rivals are important. Uh, I think it's real important. But I also, to get back to your, why well, you guys like it, I, I'm, one of the reasons I like it is it's nice to get to reward the first and second place teams. They've had a great year. They've played well. What's the advantage to that? Um, and is that playing the seventh or eighth place team? Um, probably is a little bit of advantage, but I, I don't know if there's as much of an advantage as we think there is anymore. You know, it's a little different from 10, 15 years ago when the first place had 30 more points than the eighth place team. Now we're looking at first to eighth place a lot of times as maybe three or four wins. Like it's hard to believe. I, I always tell my team at the start of the year, you know, as we start out, get a good start because in the end, the difference between making the playoffs and not making the playoffs is one win a month. That's all it is. So it's one extra win a month. If you have one extra win a month, that's five or six wins. That's 10 points. And that's the difference between making it or not making it. And it might be the difference from being eighth place or first place. That's, that's how fine of a line it is. It is. Um, so, you know, so I, I, I like the one, one versus eight, but I also have lived the scenario where the, with travel and time change and that, it can be a real grind. I know the one year, I think Nashville, I think Nashville might have won the, I don't know if they won the conference that year, but they ended up playing Anaheim in the playoffs. They had to play Anaheim and then the next series had to play San Jose. Well, the, by the time you get to that third round, you're, you're done. The travel's caught up to you and it really can swish this sw kind of swing series and stuff. So it's, yes, I agree with a lot of it, but there is other ramifications that go with it also. Jim, how uh, last? I just wanted to ask you, like, how often you mentioned Detroit? I mean, how often do you sit back and and think about what a career you've had in hockey? Uh, you know, and you know, great player. You know, uh, you think about your blueprint on that on those twenty years on the with the Red Wings and the dynasty created and the insane amount of players found and drafted and all that, and then ten years now in Dallas, uh, Stanley Cup final three years ago. How often do you do you sit back and think, man, what a career? And and um, you know, what are you most proud of right now in your career? Yeah, you know what, I, I've been very blessed. Uh, I was very fortunate to get to you know get to Detroit. Uh, you know, I, I played there, and Jimmy Devilano gave me an opportunity to go down actually to get into coaching, and uh, got into coaching. I love coaching, really, really coaching. I think for any hockey person that's been in hockey, coaching other than playing, coaching is the next best thing. Uh, the only thing is it's a tough business too. It's a tough racket. And, you know, I, I was a fourth line player as a player and moved around a lot and all of a sudden had a young family. And I got to the point where I said, can I, can I keep doing this to my family? Can I keep moving every three, four years? It's, it's not easy on the, the, the kids and the wife and everything else. So I was fortunate. Jimmy D gave me an opportunity, got an opportunity to get in the management side a little bit. And I got to learn from Jimmy DeVolano, Scotty Bowman and Ken Holland. I was very fortunate. And and I always tell people I look back, I had opportunities to go other other places earlier in my career, and probably somebody was looking out after me because if probably I would have gone, it would have been a short stay. And you know, we talk about experience and living through things in life. You can't replace that. And all of a sudden, when you do get in the big chair, if you haven't had that, this game can eat you up pretty pretty quick. You know, I, I've been fortunate to live through different situations, good and bad that you have to go through in life. You, you learn from the bad things. It makes you stronger. And and I've been lucky to be with a lot of successful situations. So so been very fortunate that way. Uh great people. In the end, I always tell people it's all about it's all about relationships and people. You uh the, the, the thing that I I I get more most proud of and what I want to keep going is when I get phone calls from other teams asking to interview the people that are working for you. I think that that's when you know you've done the right thing. That's when you know that, you know what, they, they believe in what we're doing. They believe we got the right people in place. And I know that now I've hired the right people. And that's, that's where, that's the biggest thing as an organization, I think uh, that I, where I want to get to and want to continue to, to keep going type of thing. Yeah. Until this past summer, I bet you never had a PR guy become an assistant GM. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. 
No. Yeah. Well, you you guys know Tom Holy. You yeah. know him and his staff here. They've been they've been one of the best. And uh, got the call from Mike Greer um, that he wanted to talk to Tom. And uh, great move by Mike Greer. Tom Holy's a great man, and he's going through what I went through. He got an opportunity to get into management. Now he's gonna, here. He is. He's sowing his oats, and, and away he goes. And uh, it, it's, there's some great stories out there, you know, about people that have worked their way up. I've I've got one in. You know, I had. Uh, Ryan Martin in, in Detroit was a great example. You know, we came into the uh, salary cap world. We've been out scouting, Kenny and I, and we met this young man named Ryan Martin. He's working for an agent doing things. And uh, all of a sudden, the salary cap world came in and we need a capologist. We remembered this young kid we met that was getting his lawyer and accounting degree and bing, bang, boom, we hire him. Now he's assistant GM in, uh, in uh, with New York Rangers. Tom Holy, another great example. I've got Mark Jenko here who's, Done every, yeah. wore every hat in the organization. I came in, never knew who Mark Jenko was. And my first implication was I'm going to have to clean house here in Dallas. But I said, you know what? Let's give people a chance. I sat down and watched. And Mark Jenko now is my assistant GM and Scott White's my assistant GM. So uh, it, it, there's great examples for young yeah. people. That, you know what? It, it, you don't have to take the traditional route. Just get in there, start paying your dues and have an open mind to different opportunities. Yeah. Brent Flair, the assistant GM with the uh, Philadelphia Flyers, he was a sales accountant with the Florida Panthers in like the mid nineties where Brian Murray just started hearing this guy with great ideas. And then next yeah. thing you know, Chuck Fletcher and Brian Murray interview him and they make him, they put him right in hockey ops. It's crazy. Hockey ops. Yeah. So, so there's, there's great stories. And, and like I said, it gets, you don't want to get too philosophical here, but it's a great example for younger people that yeah. you know, everybody wants to go from getting your college degree and then become the president or CEO of a company. No, there's a, sorry, but God's got a different path for you. And and just make sure you're open-minded to that path and uh, and kind of, kind of follow it and put your head down, work away. Yeah. Well, clearly something's working because your 10-year anniversary is coming up for uh, the Dallas Stars and you're sitting in first <laughs> place in the Western Conference. So I wouldn't argue against anything you just said. Jim, Thanks so much for coming on. Congrats so far on a great season, and ho hopefully we'll talk to you a little later on during the playoffs when uh, when you got your team on a run and not traveling back and forth all over the place <laughs> with the playoff format. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you, you guys. Take care. Safe yep. see, you, see you Friday, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, we'll see you Friday. That's right. Take care. Bye bye. Jim Nill, the general manager of the Dallas Stars.